Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Betty Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance. Today we are finally sending some crew up to our Artemis colony on the surface of the moon Nemesis. So what I've tried to do here is create a sort of BFR, although I guess now it's called the Starship slash Super Heavy sort of system. So we've got a super heavy, fully reusable launcher there on the bottom, and then a large Starship section which carries cargo up into orbit using six aerospike engines because I sort of designed this to be the future of our sort of launch um, capability to try and make things fully reusable, make it a two-stage vehicle, uh, essentially what SpaceX is trying to do with their upcoming Starship. Um, it is obviously nothing like it uh, <laughs> aesthetically, but using the parts that I had, um, I think functionally it's, uh, it's turning out pretty similar. Though it does use a inflatable heat shield since stainless steel um, actively cooled heat shields aren't a thing in Kerbal Space Program. I am thinking actually about installing the um, reusability mod, whatever it is that adds all the massive landing gear and the um, grid fins, etc. I think that might be a good idea because, yeah, the landing gear on this thing are pretty titchy, which is fine when we're landing on the surface of Nemesis, but I think I might use this spacecraft for uh, future missions just to other planets. Um, it's actually a pretty good all round spacecraft. So I don't know, we might apply for future uses. I decided to name it the Leto, at least this one, because Leto was the mother of Apollo and Artemis, and of course Artemis is where we're travelling. On board our spacecraft we have seven Kerbals. Um, I did intend to have more, and there will be more Kerbals on Artemis eventually, but we're kind of out of money right now, which is the reason why we're launching this. Um, Artemis is eventually going to have at least ten engineers on it, um, though we don't have the funds to hire them. Now with USI installed, there is a much more sensible hiring system, because in the stock game, each Kerbal you hire increases the cost of hiring the next Kerbal by an insane amount, to the point where it's it's just not financially feasible to even hire Kerbals. Yeah, USI gets rid of that, and it's actually cheaper to hire Kerbals in bulk. You can pick um, out of all the different roles, because USI adds a bunch of different types of Kerbals, um, one of which we've actually got on this spacecraft. You can also sort of select them on how smart and or how uh, courageous they are, and it costs more or less money depending on those factors. Uh, or you can just spend less money and get a random Kerbal, you know, it's actually it's a system that makes a hell of a lot more sense. You can see that the Leto just getting into orbit, getting a beautiful view from the cockpit there, and we're now turning around the booster to try and uh, line ourselves up for re-entry, getting our... Uh, Getting our boost back burn finished, saving a little bit of fuel just to slow us down for our final approach towards the ground. So, the Kerbals that we have on board the Leto, uh, we have five engineers, a single pilot, and we have one quartermaster, because we need um, either a pilot or a quartermaster to manage the logistics on the base so that we can actually uh, send resources from our various different mining installations to Artemis, uh, set up the automatic logistics system that comes with USI. Pilots can do it, but if you have a dedicated quartermaster, uh, they can do it a lot more efficiently. Um, and so when they level up, they're going to get much better at it, so it costs a lot less. Because it's not free, the uh, transportation of resources across the surface. There is a penalty to it, um, and so the more experienced our quartermaster is, uh, the smaller that penalty will get. So in total, we have seven um, Kerbals on board this, and I think Artemis can support something like uh, 16 Kerbals with the number of uh, recyclers it has on it. No, it'd be more like 15, yeah, because each recycler can uh, support three Kerbals, so yeah, 15, uh, or it might be 18, something like that. It can support a lot of Kerbals either way, um, but with the number of supplies we have on there, uh, yeah, if we're going to send that many Kerbals up there, we're probably going to want to expand it at some point with some kind of agroponics or agriculture module. I'm undecided whether to use agroponics or agriculture. The difference is agroponics, it reconverts uh, mulch, which is produced by the Kerbals, back into supplies using um, some pretty low efficiency hydroponics, but it's very simple, whereas agriculture just produces, uh, it just grows crops um, using fertilizer and uh, very, basically the soil on the surface of the body you're on, which produces a lot more supplies, but uh, it's, it requires a lot more machinery uh, and the like to actually set up. But considering, you know, we already have most of the infrastructure in place to deliver the resources that we need to run that module, uh, I think we will launch it at some point. But right now, as I said, we're kind of out of funds. Artemis was really expensive. Each, mo each module cost at least 600, 700,000 funds. 
even though we were using mostly reusable launch vehicles, just the modules themselves, they use a lot of very expensive parts. So this mission actually has a few different goals. So as well as taking crew up to Mars to, us, uh, to actually get it operational um, and get it producing um, rocket parts and the like, uh, we are also bringing a rover. So the rover is first of all going to play a pretty integral part in actually putting the base together because as you know the modules are sort of scattered about a little bit from some of our uh, less than ideal landing attempts although they're pretty close together to be fair i think it did an all right job uh, but the rover is also going to be our essential explanation for how we're transporting the resources from our various mining installations it has storage on board for all the various different uh, resources that we're mining across the surface of nemesis but also we have space on board for a pretty huge amount of rare metals and exotic minerals. And what we're going to do is we're going to load up the Leto with rare metals and exotic minerals and send them back to Solitude for a pretty outrageous profit. I think we're going to net about 4 million funds for the amount of storage we have on this. Now, yeah, that's a lot of rare metals and exotic minerals we've got to take back with us. Uh, so we pretty much need to refuel the Leto entirely and the Leto essentially relies upon getting refueled. As you see, we landed on fumes there. We cut it pretty fine. Uh, but thankfully, of course, we have a fuel production plant on Artemis, so it's not going to be too much of a problem. So you see here, we're just transporting our seven Kerbals into the rover and then just basically firing them out of the uh, out of the cargo bay there, which I thought was mildly entertaining. I was quite happy with how this little rover turned out. I pretty much just called it Artemis Rover. I didn't think of really giving it any kind of imaginative name, but uh, yeah, it's, it uses a lot of parts from USI that are sort of based upon NASA concept vehicles for uh, future plans to colonize the moon. And recently, NASA have I don't really want to say getting their act together, but with recent plans published by NASA, they've actually got a set goal in mind, and it's actually massively renewed my interest in what NASA's up to. Now, the SLS is still having a crazy amount of problems. Um, that rocket is looking like it's going to get cancelled, um, which honestly is a bad thing because it had a lot of capabilities, even though it was going to be horrendously expensive, a lot of capabilities that no commercial rocket can as of yet do. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit, little bit uh, sad to see that project get cancelled, especially after how many billions have been sunk into it. But uh, yeah, NASA's now got a concrete plan. You know, with every administration changing from the moon back to Mars, the moon to Mars now, the plan is back to the moon in a reliable way. So the um, lunar orbital platform, whatever the whole hell that space station's called uh, now, the gateway, whatever it is, actually has a purpose. And... They're going to launch missions from that space station down to the surface, extended, you know, a couple of month long missions, and they're actually going to build infrastructure to facilitate future colonization of the moon. And then using that technology and the lessons learned, going to go to Mars, which I think is pretty awesome. SpaceX are definitely going to beat them to Mars. I think that's almost a given at this point. But uh, but yeah, no, it's it's pretty awesome. So the plans that they're outlining, uh, I really like Jim. Was it Jim? Bridenstine, the new uh, administrator of NASA, he seems to be, uh, he's, he's sort of all in, I really like him, he, he comes across very well. Anyway, as you see here, uh, our uh, logistics and habitation module on Artemis was a fair little way away from the uh, the other two modules, so what we did is we hook up the rover, not the inflatable uh, expander tube bit, because that would have stretched, so we actually had to connect a, a pipe endpoint to connect the two craft together, and we've just dragged it up the hill. So using our um, Ben Kerman, who is our lead engineer on this mission, actually one of our original four Kerbals, uh, he's been out and uh, checking on it, and basically because of the change in incline, we have to disconnect and reconnect the rover and the module uh, just every few hundred meters or so. Um, as you'll see there, well, back a, a minute ago, so we also disassembled the uh, remnants of our, our launch stage for that first module when we came in for that crazy horizontal landing, uh, which the module somehow survived without taking any damage. Uh, but yeah, we just disassembled that into material kits and specialized parts, which will have been dumped into the, uh, into the nearby logistics module. So now we have our, uh, our module pretty much close enough. Um, we just have to get it within range. We're not trying to line up docking ports here uh, because thankfully USI actually comes with some expandable tubes that Kerbals can actually walk along. So all we have to do is connect these up and then they are connected. The base 
is actually almost operational. So what we need to do then is just connect up this uh, launch and fuel production module here, which uh, is mostly empty. It just basically contains a lot of empty space for a few hundred tons of liquid fuel oxidizer. And then connect it to our manufacturing module, which has the industrial refinery and our assembly plants ready for us to begin constructing all the various components. And now, since we've almost got the base ready, and it's in its final location, I thought it'd be time to set up a little fly. There's a little hill right in the middle of the three modules, which I thought was pretty cute. So we just set the flag atop the hill and say, Andy Weir, eat your heart out. Because of course this base is named after the moon base in Andy Weir's novel Artemis, which I would highly recommend reading. Um, very similar humour to The Martian, but uh, but very different. It was, it, was, it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Anyway, so now we have to actually set our minds towards getting Artemis fully operational. So we're expanding all of our various storage modules uh, there to try and store all the various different resources so we don't have to keep transporting resources to and from our planetary stockpile because of course as I said that does um, waste a certain amount of the resources uh, and then what we have to do is disassemble all the sky cranes that we have on here my original plan was just to launch these off uh, into space just ignite the engines and let them go but I thought you know what why waste the parts? You know, we're going to be manufacturing material kits and specialized parts on this base, so we might as well build up a little stockpile. So we just break down all the various parts into material kits and specialized parts. Uh, not particularly efficient um, conversion rate, but you know, it's better than nothing, and uh, these sky cranes weren't really doing anything anyway. So now we've done that, we're just going to try and get uh, Ben Kerman, try not to break some of the radiators, try and get him into the manufacturing module. And then we'll set our minds to uh, activating all the recyclers and actually getting the wheels and the cogs on this mighty installation actually turning. So as I said, we have five engineers and the reason why we have uh, so many engineers is essentially the way th that this works. So we need a quartermaster, as I said, to manage the logistics and then we're sticking the engineers in our key production modules because they will then speed up or essentially add their production to the production of rockets from that launch pad. So the actual production of the specialized parts and everything is actually done automatically. We don't need engineers on here to be producing our specialized parts and material kits. We need them to actually convert those into the actual rockets that we're going to be building themselves. And each Kerbal has a productivity rating depending on their intelligence, so basically how low their stupidity rating is. And then each module has a productivity factor. So the big production modules have a productivity factor of five. So if a Kerbal has a you know productivity of two, then suddenly if he's in that module, he's going to be producing a productivity of 10. And that will speed up the um, how fast we actually build rockets. Um, whereas if we stick a Kerbal, say, in just a cupola module, it might have a productivity factor of 0.25. And so you probably put your stupid Kerbals in there because your stupid Kerbals um, wouldn't really... Um, I think they might actually even impact, uh, <laughs> negatively impact your rocket production time. But yeah, these big production modules, uh, the assembly part and everything, they have a really high productivity factor. So that's where we're going to be sticking all our engineers. And once we have the return from this mission, we're going to hire ourselves a bunch more engineers and send them up in the next Leto, because we're probably going to need a fair bit <laughs> more funding at some point, especially after we launch our dual mission. Because uh, yeah, expanding the bases isn't going to be for a little while, because our, our dual transfer window is coming around very quickly so we'll probably be working on that in the next episode but yeah we're going to bulk hire a number of engineers each with uh, very high intelligence although probably very low courage as well send them up with uh, an agroponics module and then the base will be almost self-sufficient so while we're activating all the various different uh, facilities on board Artemis, activating all the habitation modules and the like, I realized that uh, we can't start the nuclear reactor because even though we have radiators on the base, there need to be radiators actually attached to the module where the reactor is housed. Um, so this is just a weird little quirk of connecting up the modules like we are. If we dock them together, I don't think it'd be a problem, but connecting them up with uh, expandable tubes like we are, um, they, it can still utilize the radiators on the other modules, but for some reason, that just the automatic safety on the reactor won't let it start unless there are radiators on the actual module itself. So thankfully, we packed a number of spare um, radiators and solar panels and all sorts of different things uh, on board the rover there. So we can just attach two small radiators 
and then we can activate our nuclear reactor, which will give us more than enough power. And I actually checked how long the fuel supply is going to work, uh, last. It's going to last, last us a few hundred years. So, yeah, we really don't need to worry. I know some of you might be wondering why we didn't use solar power. I think I meant, might have mentioned this in a previous episode. Although solar power is incredibly overpowered in After Kerbin, we would need to have enough batteries to last this base throughout the night. And... Yeah, that would be a lot of power. This this base uses a lot of juice. So we the weight of batteries we would need to last this base throughout the uh, night of Nemesis would yeah, it would be absolutely insane. This thing uses almost megawatts of power. So uh, yeah, we need to have ourselves a nuclear reactor on here. So now we've activated all our various different things. We've activated our drills as well and our um, our fuel production facility, so we're now producing liquid fuel and oxidizer, etc. We can now actually have a look at uh, our logistics. So, we are producing material kits and specialized parts, but we're using more chemicals than we're producing. We need to essentially bring along a whole other module uh, just dedicated to producing chemicals. I didn't realize quite how many chemicals production of specialized parts actually uses. Um, so yeah, we're going to need to uh, land another manufacturing module. And I think maybe I'll combine the manufacturing module with the agroponics uh, or agriculture module. I think maybe I can get that done in one launch. Um, that would be that would be pretty convenient if we could actually get away with that. Uh, we are also almost using more metals and polymers than we're producing. I say almost like we're we've got a deficiency of 0.0001. So they're very very slowly reducing our stockpiles. But I mean, if we stop production of material kits for like a day, then we'll build up a stockpile that will last us like a year. So there's no real need to add another manufacturing module just to produce those. I think we just need one, um, one more industrial refinery um, just to refine even more minerals into chemicals so that we can then supply the production of specialized parts. Uh, and then the base, we can pretty much just leave it. The, my intention here was just to get enough resources flowing into this base and being produced that we can just set everything going and not have to keep turning things off, turning things on and balancing everything. I just want to be able to leave the base producing resources and then just go and do other things for a while, come back and then we'll have our material kits uh, and specialized parts stockpiled and then we can use our various engineers to construct some rockets. But for now, uh, before we can actually launch that other module, as I said, we need some more money. So we're going to be loading up the exotic minerals and rare metals onto the Leto. But in the meantime, as it's going to take a little while to actually produce the fuel, we're going to need to refuel the Leto. We are heading back out to our Memento mission, which has got a small course change to put it very close to Drizzen. So we'll be arriving there in a few hundred days. It's going to be after our Reaper transfer window though, so uh, it's not going to be for a couple of episodes yet, but we've almost arrived at Drizzen. So uh, yeah, it's our last interplanetary probe to sort of arrive. But anyway, at this point, I kind of realized something pretty huge. I forgot to put parachutes on the Leto. So this is an entirely new launch vehicle, right, which I designed from scratch. I was like, yep, yeah, let's make a, let's make my own sort of version of the BFR or Starship as it is now. As you see, they just sort of glitched out and fell over. But yeah, I, I forgot to put parachutes on it, which is a bit of a problem because it has enough Delta V, obviously, to get back to Solitude, but loaded up with all of its rare metals and exotic minerals. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> It's not going to be able to uh, propulsively land on the surface of Solitude. Thankfully, though, we have a rocket production facility. So all we had to do was make a craft, which is literally just a box of parachutes, and then we could build it on the surface of Nemesis. So that's exactly what we did. So we built ourselves a box of parachutes on the surface of another world, which I think is a pretty massive achievement. This is the first time we've manufactured something on the surface of another world, which I think is pretty cool. And then we just get Ben Kerman out uh, to get out here and stick the parachutes onto the Leto. It's a little bit of a walk and we have to make uh, three separate trips to get over there. But yeah, I was I was really chuffed with this. <laughs> it's really cool to be able to, you know, refine our resources that we've been mining across the moon of Nemesis into um, a bunch of resources and then turn those resources into high-end goods, material kits and specialized parts, and then use those to build 
parts, which we can then use Kerbal Attachment System to then stick onto stuff. Like if we run out of screwdrivers, or we just need a little part here and there, instead of having to launch a whole new vehicle or a rescue mission, we can just manufacture it on site. And I'm thinking I might actually... Um, manufacture the extension we're going to need to make to our silicon production. That's another thing um, we're going to need to sort out before this base becomes fully operational, uh, as well as adding the crew and adding the extra module. Yeah, our silicon production plant, as I believe I mentioned, isn't running at full efficiency. We need to add some more ISRUs onto that. Well, it's mining enough. Spodamine, it doesn't have enough uh, refineries to actually match our demand um, from Artemis. So, uh, yeah, we might actually just build that module in Artemis and then just ship it over. I think that could be a pretty cool idea. But anyway, now it's time for us to lift off. We've got Kerman Kerman, which I think is a pretty fun name, uh, as our lone pilot heading back to Solitude. So we're leaving six Kerbals on the base itself just to keep things ticking over and just manufacturing um, material kits and specialized parts as much as they can. Once they run out of resources, they'll stop and then they'll build up a bit more of a stockpile and then continue just sort of stockpiling some buying them. So we're not producing them particularly efficiently right now um, because as I said we need more input resources, we need more chemicals, uh, more chemical production and we need a hell of a lot more silicon. So uh, we can actually leave the material kit production going because that just uses metals, polymers and chemicals um, but then it's the, it's the refined exotics um, and the silicon and the chemicals that go into producing specialized parts that's uh, that's the real kicker really um, so we've sort of left that production off so we can just sort of build up stockpiles of uh, our various resources there but uh, yeah after a fairly difficult lift off uh, Lito was really heavy I had to do a bit of um, I had to use Kerbal Engineer to use some Delta V calculations and figure out if we could actually manage uh, getting back to Solitude, but we just about can. Uh, we've got two massive um, 3.75 metre uh, tanks just full, absolutely laden with um, exotic minerals and rare metals, which are very, very valuable. And having recently had to write an essay for my course about the future let me, let me recite the essay title. The future opportunities, risks and opportunities of the future commercialization of space. That was it. I, I tend to know a lot about space mining now. Uh, that was a pretty huge section. Something like 700 quintillion dollars worth of raw resources in the asteroid belt alone. And, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars um, worth on the moon. It's actually pretty insane. Like a single platinum rich asteroid could contain more platinum than has been mined in the entirety of human history, which is pretty mind-boggling, just the, the sheer quantities of resources that uh, are available to us out in space. Of course, you know, we don't really have the technology or capability to access those resources yet, but, you know, it's the future. Scarcity may be a thing of the past. Uh, in the not too distant future. But you see here we're using an inflatable heat shield, which is why I couldn't create some large struts, you know, a large sort of landing gear set up all sort of you know, the big um, sort of fins that the uh, SpaceX Starship has because they would burn off on re-entry. But I am thinking about getting reusability expansion. Uh, let me know what you think about that, which adds the large folding landing legs and grid fins, etc. Which should make our reusability a little bit easier and also look a fair bit better as well. I might use those large landing gear on uh, my future mission to uh, Re Reaper or Jewel as well on our super heavy lander we're going to have to use for Tilos, which uh, has a surface gravity of 0.85 Gs. So we're trying to land as close to uh, the space center as possible to try and get the maximum amount of funds we can for our uh, for our bounty from uh, from our moon of Nemesis. And we are landing a little bit south, but uh, hey, we don't have a huge amount of control over this thing. It isn't a space shuttle; it can't fly. It's just landing propulsively. We have a little bit of trouble getting rid of the heat shield here. Uh, yeah, there are a number of things I need to correct on the uh, on the next Leto Mark II. Um, yeah. I'm probably going to make it a little bit smaller. I just had to make it big enough to accommodate the rover, which did sort of hamstring us a little bit. So I might make the next one a little bit smaller um, and make it essentially just design it around transporting goods to and from our moon of Nemesis. But there we have it. Four million funds just from space resources. We can set up a proper off-world trading company. So even though we're not exporting material kits, specialized parts or anything, just the raw resources we're mining from the surface of Nemesis are more than enough to fund our space program for pretty much the rest of the series. I don't think we have to worry about funding anymore. So all of this investment 
has finally paid off. Thank you for watching everyone, I've been the Bearded Penguin. In the next episode, we'll be building our Reaper mothership and all the associated spacecraft. And then the episode after, we should be heading off on that mission. But thank you for watching, I've been the Bearded Penguin, and I will see you all next time.